I am Pallavi Bakru, and on behalf of Grand Thornton, a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, before we dive into the discussions for today, I, I would like to share some statistics to begin with to set the context for this conversation. Uh, when Hurun started bringing out the Hurun India Rich List, which was about 10 years ago for the first time, India had exactly 100 rupee billionaires. That is Indians with a net worth of more than a thousand crores. And the last report, which is the 2021 report that Hurun has just brought out, India has 1,007 billionaires. So that's a tenfold increase. And the interesting bit is that, you know, the pandemic notwithstanding, 90% of the ultra high net worth individuals increased or retained their net worth. And about 116 of them actually doubled their wealth in the last one year. To add to this, we have in India about 1,400,000, what we call high net worth individuals. And uh, in 2019, which is the last statistics that is available, about 7,000 of them actually chose to immigrate out of India. Uh, you know, this is a significant number, but you know, what is not actually getting captured in these reports is the number of Indians who are now using the route of permanent residency without actually giving up their passports. So they're not really immigrating out of India. Uh, they are using the various sort of opportunities available to get a you know, long-term residency visa, the ability to travel back and forth multiple times and to be able to own residences and businesses at the other end without giving up their passports. So essentially, you know, trying to have the best of both worlds uh, while still keeping the choice of where they want to live and for how long. Traditionally, if you look at the reasons, uh, you know, why people have wanted to move abroad, uh, you know, they've literally been around uh, work-life opportunities, access to, you know, better education for their children, better jobs, uh, robust social security system, and better healthcare infrastructure as well. For the Uber rich, it's uh, usually been around access to international capital, uh, business opportunities, and the ability to optimize their taxes. But I think the pandemic has pivoted that decision-making uh, in a very different way because geographical borders have become redundant in a lot of ways. Uh, tech technology allows us to work and live, uh, you know, literally out of anywhere. And the wealthy want an alternative to India to park themselves and their families in uncertain times with access to better healthcare and infrastructure. The other thing that's sort of playing on people's mind is the de-risking of their business by creating an international footprint, uh, by diversifying the family wealth overseas, whether it's through real estate, whether it's through investment in international stock markets. And increasingly, uh, this is something we've seen post the pandemic, is the desire to be closer to family uh, in uncertain times. And that's driving a lot of people to actually consider moving to the home countries of their children. Uh, in India, we've seen over the years, people move to the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and you know, other parts of Europe. Uh, and these have you know, typically been driven by you know, people wanting better jobs. But increasingly we find that the wealthy are the class which have a right to passage to most countries in the world today because of the investment programs that most of the developed countries are now offering to the rich. And one of these, which is a very favored destination is the UK. And if you really look back, India and Britain have been bound by these strong ties of a shared history and culture. And, you know, this goes beyond our common love for cricket and curry. Uh, English is widely taught and spoken in India, which sort of, you know, breaks down any immediate uh, language barriers. We at Grant Thornton, you know, we run these reports called the India Meets Britain and the Britain Meets India reports. And, uh, you know, both the reports in the last couple of years have shown that UK companies continue to see India as an attractive investment destination. Similarly, UK continues you know, to be a very favored location for Indian companies wanting to do an expansion overseas. Aside of that, as I said, you know, there's been significant people to people connect as well. Uh, you know, a lot of kids from India go to the UK to study and then choose to sort of work and settle down there. Uh, you know, as per our last diaspora report, we have approximately 1.5 million people of Indian origin in the UK. So that's a great sort of living bridge, uh, you know, between the two countries as well. And in the current, uh, you know, geopolitical dynamics, uh, which have brought both, uh, you know, India and the UK on the cusp of building an even stronger 
relationship, uh, you know, both the countries are taking several steps to facilitate this engagement and deepen the partnership. Uh, there are talks of an enhanced trade relationship. Uh, there is work on in trying and sort of come to a comprehensive free trade agreement uh, in due course. And one of the focus areas uh, for both the governments has been the movement of people, professionals and businessmen between the two countries. Uh, following Brexit, UK announced a new immigration system uh, with the new regulations provide a host of opportunities to the Indian nationals, including professionals and businessmen under the various routes uh, that are allowed. India and UK have also signed a new migration and mobility partnership through which uh, both the countries will benefit from a new scheme for young Indian and British professionals to live and work in each other's countries, thereby boosting the work visas. Uh, as per the last immigration statistics, Indian nationals accounted for 41% of all skilled work visas granted in the year ended March 2021. And I think that statistic itself says a lot. We at Grant Thornton have more than three decades of experience in supporting clients on both sides of this corridor, and hence this endeavor to organize this webinar calling UK a second home, considerations for high net worth families. We are absolutely delighted that today we have immigration experts from the Visa and Immigration Department of the British High Commission itself, who will talk to us through the new immigration rules and opportunities. Another area of growing importance is investing in properties or buying a second home or a second residence in the UK. Uh, according to a wealth report brought out by Knight Frank uh, in 2019, approximately 74% of Indians buying homes abroad prefer to purchase property in the UK. Uh, you know, the reasons for these may be attributed to the ability to eventually get a permanent residency or, you know, the path to citizenship, uh, you know, de-risking of investments. Uh, and, you know, there is also a belief that, you know, UK is largely less volatile being a more developed country and offers better rental yields. Uh, and, you know, that's sort of driving a lot of people to also look at it as a part of their de-risking of their investment portfolio. And additionally, we found that, you know, UK ranked first in the Global Real Estate Transparency Index 2020, which essentially signifies that investors, uh, you know, who invest in this market have unparalleled access to information around the regulations and the health of the market in which they made these investments. Today, we're going to hear from our real estate and tax experts as well on the panel discussion uh, on how one should go about the process of investing in a second residence in UK. Uh, once again, a uh, warm welcome to all of you, and I hope you enjoy the discussions and find the interactions useful. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our first set of speakers, uh, Dave Ratcliffe and Harry Booty. Uh, Dave is the Regional Director, South and Southeast Asia, Home Office UK Visa and Immigration, based out of the UK. Harry is the International Communications Lead for the UK Visa and Immigration Department. His role is to promote awareness and understanding of the UK visa system with key audiences like business people, entrepreneurs, students, and investors. He is based out of Delhi, and we're delighted to have both Harry and Dave with us today. And with that, over to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Palavi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, really a pleasure to uh, to be on Teams. Um, I was just saying beforehand to to Palavi that, that I seem, I think, like all of us, perhaps have spent 18 months of our lives on teams rather than meeting face to face so really looking forward to to getting back to that um i am i'm say regional director uh, here and i actually based in in delhi as well as same as harry uh and it's uh as i say i think one of the the key roles for uk visas um is to try and listen to our customers and find out what we're doing right what we're doing wrong and to that end we have a customer account management team uh, three uh, of our uh, country-based staff, Dipali, who looks after the business, uh, Divya, who looks after education, and Neetu, who looks after the sort of tourism sectors. And it's really, um, really important for us to, to listen to, to all of our sectors, all of our customers, to find out what is good, what is bad. Visas can be uh, an enabler to your investment, to, to your intra-company transfers, but they can be a barrier. And um, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, your views on that of what we can do certainly better uh, going forward. Um, just sort of an overview, um, a little bit of statistics. Uh, Palavi 
very rightly said that we issue nearly 41% of all of our work visas to Indian companies, uh, and which is fantastic. And it makes India the leading country that, uh, that we do that part of the uh, sort of visa tier uh, work. Um, but it also is um, obviously reflective of the interest of Indian companies have in investing in the UK, which is a, a really positive thing for, for all of us. Um, on global talent visas, 16% um, are issued to Indian nationals, which again is the highest total um, globally. So um, yet again, the, the UK and India working together in partnership and, uh, and hopefully over the next 10 years as the, uh, the Prime Minister's roadmap, uh, PM Modi and uh, Boris Johnson have set out a roadmap so that we can work more closely together, both on uh, culturally, but also obviously on business. Um, students, Palavi also mentioned students. We, up to the end of June this year, we'd actually issued 62, just over 62 and a half thousand visas to students, young people going to the UK to, to, to study, which in a COVID year is, is quite, a, a quite amazing really. And that was up 30% on, on the, the, uh, the prior year. And I'm expecting it to go up again, possibly 20, even 30% again this year, because we've been incredibly busy over the last couple of months. Um, visits obviously has taken a dramatic downturn over the last year, but even so, um, 55,000 visit visas we've issued to, uh, to Indian citizens wanting to, to visit the UK, which is 25% of the global total. So I think those sort of st statistics put uh, the UK and India relationship uh, into, into really good perspective. Um, one thing I did want to mention just early on, and I'm sure um, Harry may mention as well, but the current situation with quarantine, um, I am hoping that on Thursday, after our ministers meet um, uh, in, in the UK, that there will be a new announcement just to uh, confirm uh, that then uh, that there will be no requirement for quarantine between India and the UK if uh, people traveling are double vaccinated. Um, COVID Shield has been recognized by the UK, by the uh, World Health Organization, et cetera. What was not um, the two systems of registration for the UK back double vaccination and the Indian double vaccination, they weren't talking to one another. And that's where the sort of the, 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 the delay I think has come. But hopefully on Thursday or first thing Friday, we'll hear some good news. Uh, and that will be the sort of the last, last hurdle, I suppose, in, in resuming normal travel between India and, and the UK. Um, what's happening at the moment? Well, um, again, Pallavi mentioned the, the um, Migration Mobility Partnership and, and the scheme for young people that will start probably January. Um, we're just working out what the, uh, how the process will work, but up to 3,000 young professionals from India will be able to travel to the UK and work there with no uh, restrictions on the type of work that they're doing. And obviously 3,000 UK nationals can come to India. So again, a really uh, great opportunity for new, uh, new sort of partnerships, uh, especially when uh, young people are coming out of university or college and don't quite know what they want to do, but can get the experience of coming to India, seeing how um, a, a new culture, uh, and then taking that uh, sort of richness back to the UK or to other countries uh, and vice versa. So a really positive step, I think, in our uh, uh, sort of uh, living bridge uh, relationship. And I just lastly wanted to sort of talk about what looking forward, um, UKVI and the Home Office are sort of have got a roadmap up to about 2025 of how visa processes and, uh, and the administration will perhaps change. Um, 2023, I'm hoping that at some point we can introduce what's called biometric re rewash. So at the moment, if you apply for a visa, you have to go to the visa application center. We take your photograph, your fingerprints, and we have to do that every time you make an application. Well, of course, your fingerprints don't change. Uh, your uh, appearance doesn't change that much. Um, so hopefully uh, by 2023 or sometime uh, in that year, we'll be able to use a previous set of biometrics for a new visa application, which will obviously save you time and effort in going down to the, the visa application center. E-visas, um, hoping to roll that out in 2024 to 2025. Um, similar, I suppose, process to if you go to Australia or to Canada uh, and that you sort of apply online, you get your permission online 
and then when you get to the airports, you can use the e-gates to go through, etc. So it should make travelling uh, much, much simpler and, uh, and, and easier for, for all of us. Um, that's sort of 2024, 2025, um, sort of the plan at the moment. So, and by that stage, one of the sort of the key home office uh, considerations is to ensure that then all decision making, all the visa officers, and I've got about 50 or so working here in Delhi at the moment, but those, those jobs would be back in the UK. And so we would centralize our decision making process in the UK and just have smaller teams um, and abroad to do um, various sort of work customer relations, that type of thing. So I'm going to stop there because I think that's uh, the overview. And I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Harry, who will take you through his presentation. Thanks ever so much. Thanks, Dave. Uh, useful introduction. So I will just go straight into my presentation without further introduction. Uh, so my name is Harry. I'm based in Delhi, as has been mentioned. And uh, my job today is to go through some of the policy as well as some of the wider operational and uh, political context um, about uh, UK visas at the moment, particularly targeted at high net worth individuals and uh, business people, entrepreneurs and similar groups. So with that in mind, uh, just uh, that uh, is what we will cover today. Like I mentioned, common visa routes, upcoming changes in UK immigration policy, UK visa operations in India, and current rules around travel to the UK, um, all of which Dave has, has partly covered, but I will obviously go through in some more policy detail. Uh, so this is the overview. I'll go through a couple of slides initially quickly. Uh, business visit visa, we are processing them. We've been processing them for a couple of months since India was taken off the red list. Uh, we had suspended all visit visas during that time, but India coming off the red list was a, a big positive for the bilateral travel situation and really opened up the UK to India and was really impactful in terms of visit visa applications as well. Uh, we are processing them and we are accepting uh, super priority and priority visa across multiple centers in India as well. So in terms of the, the business of applying for that uh, shorter term trip, that is, that is practical and that is permissible. And that will cover a lot of activities as, as a later slide will cover. Um, couple, we've up updated last December uh, as part of moving to the, uh, we completed our exit from the European Union on the 31st of December, 2020. Uh, the, there was a transition arrangement, a sort of economic halfway house, uh, which the UK exited on the 1st of January, 2021. And as part of that, the points-based system went live as a new um, complete policy area. And linked to that, we updated the skilled worker visa and intercompany transfer visas. Those two visa routes are, are what was referenced when um, both Pallavi and Dave said uh, 40, over 40% 40 of, our, of our worker visas go to Indian nationals. India has always been dominant in that route, reflective of uh, the large diaspora, the large international interests of many companies, primarily from the IT sector, but also others, and, and reflective of the scale of investment these companies are doing in the UK. Um, I can go into further details, but in terms of the skilled worker visa, we've mainly improved it by uh, offering a lower salary threshold, a uh, less admin, no resident test, so they don't have to offer it to a UK national before, or UK resident before an uh, international resident. And, um, and we suspended the cap on numbers. Uh, many of you will be looking for the other routes that I'll go into in a minute, but if you're looking to employ people or if you are a skilled professional, it is now easier to get a visa on that route uh, in terms of there's no cap on numbers and less admin. Another visa for, for professionals, but particularly important at the moment, just as, as a sign of how we're developing our immigration system, the health and care visa, specifically, not just for doctors, nurses, but associate professions, radiologists, senior care workers, um, anaesthetists, an array of health and care professions were, uh, well, that was opened last August, in addition to various actions to support healthcare professionals already in the UK, for example, given, giving them free visa extensions. Uh, and that is basically cheaper, they don't have to pay the immigration health surcharge, and also um, a slightly more streamlined process. So a uh, recognition of how vital health and care workers are, again, maybe not for this group, but India is hugely well represented, particularly South India, but all of India as a whole, it's hugely well represented in that group. Uh, so another sort of um, boost for UK-Indian mobility. 
Representative and Overseas Business Visa, also called Sol Rep or Sol Representative. I imagine partners at Grant Thornton are very well aware of this route. It's very common for people to set up new entities in the UK. Uh, and again, uh, there's some more detail shortly. Uh, this and this is probably our uh, single slide on high net worth individuals. These would be the routes that people are looking at. Um, the investor visa remains and is uh, for investment of two million pounds or more. And then the higher level of investment uh, leads to a faster route to settlement. Uh, so two million, I think it's after five years, five million after three years, 10 million after two years of residence in the UK, you can apply for settlement. We also have these two routes at the top, startup and innovator. Uh, these are sort of siblings is how I've referred to them in the past. The startup is the little brother and innovator is the, the big brother or big sister as, as you prefer. Uh, startup is for two years. You don't, need, um, you don't need funding at all. So it can be a very new business plan, but you can't extend the visa. You can possibly apply again if, you, if your first business doesn't work out and you apply for another but um, you can't renew it indefinitely for the same project. Uh, so that's a two-year visa, and it gives you that foothold in the UK to establish something. That could be a new graduate from the UK, or it could, uh, from a UK institution, or it could be someone directly coming from India. Uh, if you want to stay longer, or if you have the funds and the experience, the Innovator visa is three years, indefinitely renewable, and uh, requiring at least 50,000 pounds of funds to invest but it's a chance to um, stay in the UK longer and develop projects indefinitely. Uh, investor visa covered and the global talent, you'll get, I think you'll probably see a lot of this if you follow UK India debates in this area over the next year. Um, the UK is very keen to recruit talent from around the world. And we are using routes such as global talent, but, not, but there are other routes as well, which I'll cover shortly, uh, which will um, basically identify uh, identify leaders or potential leaders in academia, research, arts, culture, digital technology, and other some other areas as well, which are still being discussed, and basically encourage them to come to the UK. We have these individuals who are highly skilled in, say, banking or tech businesses or investment or, or something like that, and they may have skills that need to come to the UK. Um, we're aware that's a competitive market. Uh, they may be choosing San Francisco or New York or Singapore or Hong Kong. And we're also aware that visas aren't all of that debate. People are looking at other things like tax regimes, um, living, living costs, standard of living, weather even for some we've heard. Um, but visas are a big part of that to be that sort of um, ability for people to do that. So there's a wider cross-government campaign that will look at this stuff in the next six to 12 months. Um, uh, essentially a talent recruitment campaign and India very much is in the top three countries that we're targeting there so uh, yeah it's, 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 it's targeted sectors um, but it is going to be a quite a prominent route. Uh, visitor visa I covered this in my initial slide but uh, to reiterate these are being processed and we and you're welcome to go for there as of the time of delivery of this presentation there is a quarantine requirement but as Dave mentioned, that's, that is being um, resolved. Uh, to reiterate, these permitted activities to the left, such as meetings, negotiating or signing deals, um, research, training, visiting sites, assessing projects, all of that sort of initial or short-term business activity is all permitted on a business visit visa. And the visit visa is the same. So you could, you know, you could visit Edgebaston to watch a cricket match, and then you could visit uh, your business center to assess a new site. You don't get a family or a tourist visit and a business visit. It's all conducted within a visit visa. You can't, however, take a new job. So you couldn't take three month paid work in, on a visit visa. It, ha it has to be your, your existing employment outside the UK. And again, I think you must know this. You all must know this, but you can't, for example, live in the UK for a long time. Um, there's a six month limit on, on staying in the UK. And, um, it's, but you can't expect to go for six months, come back for two days and go for six months. That's long been the case. But generally, business visit visas are being processed and are available. Startup, I covered, I covered this uh, a bit, but I would just reference again, the startup is two years, non-renewable. Innovator is three years, indefinitely renewable. After five years on either startup plus innovator or two times innovator, after five years residence, you can apply for permanent residency. And there is not a large, apart, there's not a large personal financial requirement. Um, you need 945 pounds. That's essentially uh, immediate living costs that you need. Um, but you do not, but 
you do not need any other funds for startup and you need this 50,000 investment for Innovator. Uh, some more detail on the Innovator visa. Um, I think I've covered it all, but the price is there. And again, 15 working days. I can take questions on that, but otherwise I'll move on. Uh, sole rep or representative of an overseas business. Now this, for the moment, um, I can't speak for the future, but for the moment, this has actually been, uh, there hasn't been so much change in this route compared to other routes in the last two years, the UK completing exit from the European Union and the new system. Uh, we, we do assess all routes and, and we may reform in future, but not currently a position. Um, it is for the sole representative who's a senior authority, uh, of part of a business um, who goes to the UK to set up a branch or subsidiary organization for a business. Um, you can answer questions on that again up to five years, initially three extended by two permanent residency after that, but otherwise there hasn't been too much change there. Uh, I won't read out all of this slide, but it's useful if you wish to take a screen grab and as um, Grant Thornton colleagues mentioned, the, there will be a video of this presentation also, but as a useful sort of reference point for how much some of these visas are, uh, there's, there's our cost there. Uh, in terms of process, uh, almost finished on the slide, but in terms of process, um, it is still, we do have a vision, uh, Dave referenced it, we also have a vision to make our visa process more digital, um, which is part of what's called the Border 2025 project. And part of that is moving towards e-visas, which we already do for some routes, such as uh, the graduate route post-study work visa. Uh, but for now, we have the same system as we have had in the previous years, where you apply online, you submit your information, uh, you, submit, you, you make your payment, and uh, you book a visa application center appointment with VFS at that point, and then you visit that visa application center, submit documents if you've not been able to submit them digitally, and then they're sent to wherever the visa officer is. That could be in Delhi, or there are many routes, such as all those um, high net worth individual routes, such as Innovator or uh, Global Talent or Investor, they're assessed in England. Uh, vast majority of people from India are accepted. Uh, for India as a whole, it's 91% approval. For these routes, it is anywhere between 97 and 99%. So it's, it's usually uh, a bit more successful, uh, but um, obviously, uh, if, if you need to seek advice or anything like that, you're welcome to do that. But it's um, when I often find that people think we're harsher than we are. As long as you do everything right, as long as you take your time, methodically submit your application, India is a very, very high approval market. Uh, final One of the final areas, um, I mentioned about the points-based system and our project to improve that. Uh, this is just a look at where we are currently in terms of the policies. We've initiated the graduate route, which is a new post-study work visa that I just mentioned. Uh, that opened on the 1st of July and India, which is a quarter of all our students and increasing at a really strong rate, uh, is a huge customer for the graduate route. Um, this could be relevant for your children or, or personal contacts who are studying in the UK and want to have that opportunity to work for two to three years after their studies. Or it could be an option for you as an employer that there's going to be uh, an extra 200,000 graduates of UK universities who now have two years uh, work rights to be in the UK. It opened two or three months ago, and we, we've had uh, uh, in, in the tens of thousands applications. Uh, so it's still new, but it's there, and it's a huge boost for Indians in particular, but students in general. Uh, we reformed the student visa route, uh, made it a bit less admin and a bit earlier, uh, a bit uh, more streamlined application process. We've reformed the skilled worker route, which I mentioned, lower salary thresholds, less admin. And this isn't for India in particular, but is another good example of our immigration system as a whole. We created a BNO visa uh, for Hong Kongers who held a BNO passport um, in reflection of the actions of the Chinese government who changed the status of the Hong Kong um, territory unilaterally. Uh, it's just an example of how we will create a, we will use our immigration system to support our bilateral and um, international aims. Uh, this was to support the Hong Kong population in particular, but as an example, the UK trying to use its its policy as a force for good, and that has that has worked successfully as well, which is welcome for the Hong Kongers in particular. Upcoming, these are all uh, the first three routes are all global. India again will always benefit because it's such a large immigration customer. High potential is for people who are um, who are who have evidence that they have a particularly high potential in a certain sectors or businesses who the UK wants to attract. So a sort of partner to the global talent route. Uh, the scale up is for people who have existing businesses and want to expand them in the UK. 
So again, perhaps a partner for, for sole rep or um, startup, but an, a chance for uh, to, to reach more groups. Uh, we're looking at improving the innovator visa. That's by basically making it available to more sectors and businesses. And those are the three main um, three main global routes. Dave mentioned uh, briefly, this is all next year that we're looking at, probably the first half of next year. And then finally, the Young Professional Scheme, which Dave mentioned, 3,000 places for Indian nationals to work in uh, the UK, which again, we're looking at opening early next year. So, so I think that shows that we've got strong routes coming up for high skill individuals. And we've also got a route for, for the graduate route and Young Professional Scheme, we've got a route for um, younger, high, high talent people also. Uh, Dave covered this, so I won't spend much, uh, but for India for now, again, as of today, or as of me delivering this today, is on the list of countries which is not red list, but does not currently have mutually agreed vaccine recognition, which means that home quarantine of up to 10 days is required and is possibly shortened to five days in England, the test release scheme. Um, there is also a requirement for COVID testing before and after your arrival. UK and India are discussing this, as Dave said, it is hopeful and perhaps likely that these re requirements will be reduced and Indian, India and UK will successfully agree vaccination protocols. That's not the case as of today, but I would just encourage you to pay close attention to these guidelines if you're planning trips in the next uh, one to four weeks, because it could change. And then hopefully in the longer term, it will have changed by that point. Uh, final, final slide. We are running application centres across most of all the main metro cities and all our main centres. Some small centres such as um, uh, Trivandrum or uh, the, our second Bangalore centre in Whitefield. These are not running due to low demand relating to COVID, but all our main centres across main centre in Bangalore, all other main metros are covered by visa centres. Prior to visa services running as a super priority in certain centres, it is very busy. And we are uh, unfortunately uh, slightly slower on some visit visa applications. So we do encourage you to apply early and use priority visa if you need to travel soon. And if you have any questions or concerns about the particular visa center, check the VFS website. So thank you for that. That's all I have in terms of presentation. Happy to uh, take any questions on that. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Dave. Um, and I think we'll jump into um, taking some questions uh, on the immigration topic. Uh, can I request Dave to come online as well? So uh, we, we may have one question for you, Dave. Uh, uh, but but uh, Harry, to begin with, I think you mentioned about the innovator visa versus the, uh, the startup visa. Um, I mean, we had the tech visa in the past, which was something similar on similar lines. Uh, and there is always been some challenges around finding the endorsing body to endorse these visas. Uh, can you throw some more light on it in terms of uh, how, how, how do people get access to those endorsing bodies? Yeah, so they're not, um, they're not hidden away. They are available on gov.uk. And there are, we're increasing these all the time, but there are about, I'm not, I'm not going to try and I don't have the number to hand, but there are dozens of um, these endorsing bodies and they're increasing all the time. Um, basically, the, it's a two-stage process. So the Home Office has taken the decision to say, we are immigration people, we're not uh, business experts. So it shouldn't be a caseworker who says that's good business, that's a bad business, etc. It should be the, the professional uh, organization in that sector. So there are various uh, accelerators, I think they're called, um, business um, facilitation services, uh, trade representative bodies such as Tech Nation, uh, and others which will assess a body, uh, assess a business and um, and basically endorse it, which is a formal process. That's stage one. Stage two is then going to the Home Office with uh, with that endorsement and also just basically identity checks. It's not uh, it's not a detailed process after that. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are many, the, the way people would do it, they would look at this list of uh, tech, uh, of not just of tech, sorry, of innovators endorsing bodies. And then they would select one that works for them and then enter into a dialogue with them. The criteria for accessing these endorsing bodies is different. Um, some of them have schemes to support certain businesses and all of that. So it would, it would depend on the organization, uh, but it would, it would be firstly going to this body and picking one that's for them. Uh, I think to reference the very first part of your question, 
I think the Home Office recognises that um, this visa could be improved. And as I mentioned, we are looking at doing that. It is heavily skewed towards the tech sector at the moment, not exclusively, yeah. but heavily. But policy colleagues are looking at, uh, at expanding it to other sectors as well. Um, so, yeah, so currently the, the endorsing bodies are there and you'd have to discuss this with them. But we are looking at um, expanding the uh, eligibility. But the principle of the Home Office not accessing a business a business expert doing it uh, is one that will remain. It's just we'll try and expand that list of business experts who can do that. That's what we're looking at doing. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Ali. That's very useful. And I think, um, Dave, thanks for that um, update uh, when, when you began talking about uh, how things could get better by the end of this week. So I'm very happy to say that you heard it first on the Grand Thornton platform <laughs> that <laughs> this, uh, this situation is hope. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, that's great news. I mean, the question that came up with one of, one of our um, guests was that uh, are the governments also considering Covaxin? to get a similar treatment as Covishield? Yeah, I, I understand that the, um, the health officials from both the UK and, and India are discussing that as well. Um, I think that's a slightly separate discussion to the, the, um, the quarantine aspects, um, but, uh, but certainly the, it's Covishield, which is I think the, the major focus, but in, on, um, on the sidelines, uh, obviously, uh, Covaxin is, is WHO authorized, etc. So there's, it, it has to be a sort of a government to government um, uh, officials level to sort of have those discussions and get that agreement. But I'm, well, who am I to say? But I'm pretty sure that as we go forward, um, countries will have to accept that a a recognised and agreed uh, vaccine, be it um, um, Sinopharm or, or or Sputnik or etc. If the World Health Organization and other medical experts agree that that's a good form of vaccination then i think countries will have to you know accept that um uh, and so get back to normal so uh, yeah watch this space i think is is the answer to that okay that that's that's promising thank you for that dave uh, Harry, can i come back to you another question uh, is because we're talking about the high net worth individuals and we're talking about buying a real estate asset in the uk as the next topic to talk about uh, when we look at investor visa um, can you throw a bit more of light in terms of the the how, how the two million pound needs to be structured in, in very simple terms in terms of where that money can be put in and what can it be used for and what cannot be used for? Uh, so it is technical. I'll, I'll just get up the guidance just to remind myself as well. Um, but we uh, it's a general rule that uh, firstly that you have to um, you have to be in full control of the money uh, that you have to um, be be uh, the the full owner of it, and and it's a sort of um, it's a not necessarily personal money, but it's something that you are you are taking the choice to invest in the UK rather than, um, for example, um, indirectly managing investment uh, for someone else. Um, and then it, it it is slightly general, and this the rules the rules were updated a bit over a year ago. Not um, not massively changing in terms of the behaviour, but it was just the technical language that I wanted to check, and that is that uh, basically they have to be um, uh, held within a regulated financial institution, and that they have to uh, be free to spend in the UK. So the two principles that the uh, Home Office is looking for there is that a you know the money is in a very broad sense legitimate that you know it, it, it's it's regulated. It's, it's held within an institution that is um, trustworthy. Again, in a general sense, people people always, and it always feels like a personal thing when you say it, but it's a, a general global sense. It's uh, in an institution that's regulated. And then again, it's active investment in the UK. So it's looking at supporting businesses, creating jobs, all of that sort of stuff, rather than potentially being parked in a, not an expert myself, but parked in a low yield, inactive financial product that may not, generate economic activity in the UK. So it's a subjective assessment, but the two principles that uh, that that were updated last year and are, are key now is that the money is in a regulated financial institution. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that would be regulated not just by the British, it would be regulated by the country of the funding where the institution is. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess the RBI in this case. Um, 
and then the money is is actively used to invest in the UK rather than a sort of passive low yield instrument. There's a lot of detailed guidance on that, but those are the principles that that the investor route, investor route Thank operates. You. Thanks, Ari. That's as usual. And I think we'll be talking a bit more about it in terms of once that money comes in, how that can be used uh, and structured from a tax perspective as well. Uh, and and one, I think one one more question. I think this is the you mentioned about the uh, the global talent visa. Um, so 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 I think that's something that's going to be of interest as well for uh, Indian entrepreneurs and and Indian professionals. How, how different is it from the skilled? Uh, Workers visa and 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 how do you, how do you define exceptional talent? How how do you arrive at that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, yeah. I, I've I've discussed this before internally about how one defines exceptional. We have changed the name from from exceptional to global, but exceptional was the legacy of it. Um, so there are specifically there are sectors like I mentioned, tech, academia, film, creative, uh, and some other sectors which are there. Um, and then uh, beyond that, it is again a subjective assessment, um, which is basically that through either your academic ability, your personal experience, your um, entrepreneurial history, or even your professional experience, or, or commonly your professional experience, you can say that um, you have achieved at a, at a significantly above average level. Um, random examples that have been given is creating a, a high value business at a young age or um, achieving a senior level within a company or uh, gaining a PhD in, uh, who knows, robotics or something like that. Um, so it is that, it's not, it's not the, you know, it's not Bill Gates or, or the people who come along once in a generation. It's people who are higher talented with specific skills, particularly in tech, but not exclusively. Um, how it differs from the skilled worker, up, the, main, the main two points, is that first you don't need a job offer for the skilled worker it's a sponsorship system you have to get a job offer from a company and they will sponsor you and take you over and they'll generate a certificate of sponsorship so you must have a, a job to get the skilled worker visa whereas the global talent visa you can come to the uk and if you wished you could you could not work at all uh, or you could work a little in one job you could start a project you could do research you could do all of that at the same time and that's totally fine so the freedom to switch jobs or do other activities is really key to the global talent route. And those routes that I mentioned, such as um, high potential, these routes coming next year, they're, they're working on that principle as well. Um, and then the other key benefit of global talent is that not for everybody, but as a, it's open to everybody, but not everybody will do it, is that it offers accelerated route assessment. So after three years instead of five years, if you meet some of the criteria. So you have more freedom while you're there and you have a quicker ability to settle in the UK, uh, which um, for many people, uh, and many people from this country will definitely be eligible for it and should be considering it. And as I say, that the, there's a new organisation called the Office for Talent hosted within the UK government, which is looking at this from a visa perspective, but also other things such as uh, quality of living, opportunities to create businesses, all that sort of stuff. It is a very big priority for the, for the PM and, and his government. So it'll be a big, you'll hear it a lot from the UK government in the next year, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Dave. Um, as, a, as we expected, there are a lot of questions coming on immigration, but we, we, we are running short of time and we have the next panel to begin with as well. So uh, I think what we're going to do is take all the questions and maybe uh, Dave and Harry, if it's all right, we run those questions past you both to get some uh, brief answers from you, which we can create an FAQ and share with the audience, if that's all right. Um, so, but. But uh, thanks on behalf of Grant Thornton, we'd like to thank uh, Harry and Dave both for giving your time today for this session. Um, and it's been absolutely enlightening. And as I said in the beginning, uh, you heard it first on the Grant Thornton platform that things are going to get better on the India Utility Corridor by end of this week. So on that note, fingers crossed, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for, for your time. And uh, we are now quickly going to jump onto the panel discussion, which is the next topic uh, about uh, buying a second home in the UK. So can I request my fellow panelists to, to, to switch on that camera so I can see I can see the, the key people there. So excellent. Uh, uh, let me introduce uh, my fellow panelists. So uh, shall I begin with Anuj Chande, my colleague uh, from Grand Thornton, UK. Anuj heads up the South Asia Business Group at Grand Thornton and he's been at the forefront of the India-UK action for over three decades. Uh, so without giving Anuj's age away, He's been there, done that, uh, and uh, Anuj is going to talk all about his experiences on the corridor. 
Uh, and then, of course, you heard from Pallavi. Uh, Pallavi uh, is, is a tax partner, um, works a lot with private clients. Um, again, proverbial been there, done that, and head of the India-UK corridor and Grand Thornton India. Um, and, and Pallavi will also be sharing her experiences in terms of what she's hearing in the market. Um, and then my fellow colleague from Grand Thornton UK, Sanjeev Sangar. Sanjeev uh, is a tax partner. Um, he's, uh, he's quite active on the India UK corridor as well, working with uh, high net worth individuals on their investment aspirations into the UK and other parts of the world. Uh, so Sanjeev is going to talk the UK tax language to us in, in simple and lucid terms. So we're looking forward to Sanjeev's uh, answers. And then finally, last but not the least, uh, Reshma uh, Mukhi from Millennium Blue. Uh, Reshma has been at the forefront of helping a lot of Indian high net worth individuals with, with, with their dream aspirations of buying a home in London and, 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 and the UK. So we're going to hear all about the do, do's and don'ts and the finer nuances of buying a good property in the UK. So Reshma, uh, we're going to put you in a tight spot very soon. Uh, but to begin with, uh, Pallavi, let me come to you first because you, you are in Delhi. And, and you are close to our clients and you're close to uh, the people who are actively looking at all kinds of options of immigration and investing in the UK uh, for, as you rightly said in the beginning, for all the right reasons, curry, cricket, commonwealth, there's a lot of connects between the two countries. So you're seeing a lot of interest. But what are you hearing in the market when you're talking to uh, your clients and contacts on a day-to-day -day basis? And then also, is COVID playing a, a deciding factor in all this, or is this pushing uh, uh, this this activity a bit more um, aggressively now? I think, I think that's an interesting question to start with, uh, Chandru, because yes, uh, you know, as I mentioned, this is not a new trend. Uh, you know, Indians have uh, over a period of time been immigrating to you know uh, US, UK, and some of the other countries. Uh, but definitely, I think there's an uptick. Uh, and as I said, you know, uh, COVID has been a bit of a, a game changer, if I may say so. I think in two ways. Uh, you know, one is, of course, the fact that uh, people now increasingly realize that we live in a very mobile world. You know, you can sort of work out of a different geography. Even within India, we find, you know, people who have their jobs in Delhi are actually working out of cities other than Delhi. And you just interpolate this idea and, you know, take it cross borders and, you know, people are evaluating those options. But I think what's also interesting uh, and why this whole trend, you know, needs to be looked at. And I'll split it into two parts. One is why are people looking, uh, you know, to look, sort of live abroad or migrate abroad? And the other is why UK? I think that will sort of cover it well. So, uh, you know, when, when we talk about people moving abroad, traditionally people moved abroad for jobs. You know, they were typically engineers, doctors, you know, you, you did, got an IIT degree and it was your ticket to a good job, you know, with an MNC or whatever abroad and you moved. What we're seeing off late is a lot of the rich wanting their children to be there. And I think that's largely coming from, and when I say rich, it's not just business families, it's equally applicable to, you know, executives or large firms, you know, people who run private equity funds and all of that is one, uh, you know, once their kids study there, it's very difficult to bring them back into the traditional family business. Uh, doing business in India is not particularly easy. You need to get your hands dirty. You need to get involved. Not everybody's children want to do that or are equipped to do that because, you know, they've probably lived in a very sanitized world away from, the, you know, the nitty gritty of the business. So it's not easy, easy to bring them back. And therefore, you know, the, the ability to find them a place where they can live and, sort of adjust and you know do something valuable with their lives. The other is a lot of the second generation now wants to not necessarily come into the traditional business, wants to do something new age. You know, for example, there's so many scales of large families now who want to do something in the crypto space, they want to do something in the NFT space. And we suddenly find that India is not a country which has very well laid out regulations around these. So that's another thing that's driving people to look at countries like the UK for, you know, sort of greater clarity around some of the things that they want to do away from the traditional business, you know, access to good financial markets, access to capital markets, investors. I think that's been another one. Uh, what we also find is, uh, you know, healthcare has become a big issue, uh, you know, after COVID. People want to have the ability of having another place to live and be in, 
uh, you know, where good healthcare is available because we realize in India in the second wave, particularly that irrespective of how much of money you had, or how you know, wealthy you may have been, it was impossible to get a bed in a hospital. I think that's really sort of shaken up people. And, and at some level, I think a lot of people also choosing to live abroad, particularly from, you know, the high net worth category is because they don't want to be in the globe, sort of in the limelight. They just sort of value their privacy a little more and want to be there. You know, UK, as I said, is, is a very natural choice. There's a huge element of familiarity, you know, either the parents or the kids, you know, they've studied in the UK. Uh, it's easy to adjust. Uh, there is a huge Indian diaspora. So, you know, it's like home away from home. But I think more than that, it's the ease of doing business in, India, in, in the UK, which has also sort of mm. tempted a lot of people to go there. I remember Anuj and I were on a panel where we were talking to the chairman of United Phosphorus. And he said that, you know, I mean, when I, I mean, which is a multi-billion dollar company in India, he says, when I opened operations in the UK and my team came and said, yes, we are ready to sort of go. He said, I was very surprised. I kept asking them, don't I need to meet somebody? Don't I need to go to some <laughs> office? You know, and he was told, no, you know, yeah. it's all good. Mm -hmm. You're ready to go. And then, of course, you know, you have schemes like the Res non dom scheme in the UK, which, you know, even makes it more attractive for the rich to sort of consider UK. So I think it's a multiple reasons, which is really driving people to look at, you know, opportunities outside of India and particularly in the UK. Mm -hmm. now, now, I think you very eloquently put there, uh, Pallavi, in terms of what you're seeing in the market and, and what are the kind of like, uh, hooks really as far as UK is concerned for, for Indian high net worth individuals. So, so I think that genuine interest, that appetite is there from the Indian side. But I'm going to quickly jump to Anuj now. Um, that if we see the interest at the Indian end, but Anuj, uh, you, you've been active, as I said, on the corridor for a long, long time. So you, you've seen the genesis of this movement, isn't it, over, over the last few decades. Yeah, and then what we're seeing now recently is almost like a culmination of that interest of immigration, followed by academics of children, uh, buying a real estate asset in the UK, and, and then having a business interest in the UK. So all those things are coming together. So do you want to throw some light on it in terms of what you are seeing at the UK end of the spectrum in terms of people coming in um, and, and share your thoughts with us? Thank you. Thank you, Chandru. And, uh... Uh, thank, uh, thank you for, for uh, asking me that question. So I think, and, and I generally want to echo Pallavi's point, so I don't want to repeat what she said, but she's made some excellent points about why the UK in particular is attractive to, to Indian uh, high net worth individuals. Um, the only two sort of two points I would add to, to what Pallavi has said is that uh, number one, and, and she alluded to it partly, is that tax-wise, UK still remains very attractive to to Indian uh, individuals who basically want to be here for the short term. And I'm sure Sanjeev, my colleague, will talk in more detail about that. But there is still a very attractive tax regime. And uh, both from a personal side and even from a corporate side, uh, the tax rates that uh, the UK has still remain the lowest in Europe. Uh, we know that they're going to increase over the next three, four years, but it still remains uh, one of the lowest in, in, in Europe. Uh, and, I, and I know that there are many um, uh, UK Indian companies that are looking to set up and have set up their headquarters actually in, in the UK as, as their holding company structure. Uh, so the tax was the, fir the first one I just wanted to add to, to Pallavi's uh, point. The second thing is that in terms of uh, real estate, real estate is very much in the Indian blood and that applies to both Indians who are living in India, but even the Indian diaspora here. So real estate has always been a good investment vehicle. Uh, we know that the yields in India are pretty low in terms of investment uh, investment properties, whereas the UK is fairly attractive, you know, at about three percent three percent yield. So that that's another reason for for why the UK is attractive uh, from that sort of real estate uh, point of view. Uh, going back to your original question about um, what have I seen over the thirty years that that I've been involved in this in this corridor? I'm, I I think I've seen sort of interestingly sort of three phases so the first phase was in 91 when as we know uh, India uh, liberalized its economy and we had a huge uh, influx of uh, Indian investors Indian uh, companies the, particularly the large ones uh, looking to set uh, buy businesses here or set up greenfield sites and the founders and the owners and promoters of those businesses decided to become NRIs. Um, either themselves or, or, or members of their family became NRIs and then they bought homes here in the UK. And then that went on for, for quite a period. Um, and then you had the sort of uh, the introduction of the uh, uh, L, L, you know, LRM, L, LRM scheme 
which in the, in the in late 1999 and 2000, which again brought a whole new uh, uh, group of individual Indian Indian investors who were looking to uh, diversify um, some of their wealth uh, and look at buying second homes. Um, and as Pallavi said, also in terms of uh, providing homes for their for their children, etc. Uh, so that was the the, the 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 second wave. And I think the third wave is is really what Pallavi has alluded to now is the the post COVID wave normal as, as, as we know it, where, uh, as Balavi has quite eloquently put, that, you know, health has become a much more important issue. I think the importance of being close to your family has become has become a, uh, an issue for, for, for families. And I think the third thing is, is um, the, the, the digital world we live in. Um, you know, as mentioned, you know, you can actually do business um, sitting in London, uh, but managing uh, part, part of your business. Um, in, in, in India. So I think that that, that those that and I, mean, and I do see that increasingly we will see more and more uh, Indians looking to, to come to the UK for for all the reasons that Pallavi's mentioned already. Uh, but I think uh, because of this, uh, uh, this, this, this need to be close to the to the family, etc. Um, and, and I think that that's that's something I think the other thing is also is that a number of Indian families are now also setting up family offices and they're setting up family offices in the UK. Again, the UK uh, regulatory environment is, 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 is you know, well established for setting up of family offices. Um, and I think lastly, the other area is that London still remains the financial capital of, yeah. of, of, of the world and access to capital um, is available in London. So again, by being in London, you're close to the investor base. You're close to to all the intermediaries and all the advisors, etc., who can help you uh, in terms of raising raising funding. So I think that sort of hopefully gives you an idea of my perspective, um, and I totally echo uh, what what Pallavi has said. And uh, um, I hope that answers the question that you. Yeah. Have. Thank you. Thank you, Anuj. Thank you for that. And in fact, very important point you mentioned about digital, uh, the digital world we live in, and as I think Ms. Mr. Uday Kotak mentioned in one of the events as well, that geography is history now. So wherever you are, you can carry on with your business. So, so that is always there. And I think I can I can also say the importance of London because uh, I think I can I heard a uh, I saw a comment on the chat box about uh, tax rates in Ireland, but all I can say is London is not Dublin. So, so people want to come to London for a reason and, and, and the tax rates then goes out of the window kind of thing when, when, we, when people want to come to London. But on that note, London, real estate, uh, it's not just about Park Lane, isn't it, Reshma? It's all about um, where you can get a good property, good valuation, good value for money. So how does one go about uh, searching for a a nice property, which is something that you specialize in. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And um, hello and good afternoon all. It's a pleasure to meet you across on Zoom. Um, I established a property buying and advisory agency over 10 years ago, solely to look after the interests of international buyers. And um, I've had many years of experience assisting families buy beautiful homes and investment properties in the UK. And I would love to share that experience with you. To begin, it is important to consider resale value when buying a home. If you buy in the right location while also being close to essential shops and good transportation, you will protect the value of your asset and ensure your ability to sell easily and with profit should you need to. Typically, the process of buying residential property inv involves, firstly, identifying the neighborhood, bearing in mind which area would best suit your budget and your lifestyle. The next step, having clarity about what you want, house, flat, size of uh, bedrooms, bathrooms, etc. Thirdly, deciding on the avenue you'd like to take to find it. There are four main avenues, calling estate agents directly, using search platforms like Zoopla, Rightmove, which give you access to properties listed by all the estate agents, independents, national, international, contacting developers if you are looking for a new build, working with exclusive buying agencies who are a one-stop shop 
as they utilize all the above avenues in addition to their network of contacts. The fourth crucial component is having a great team. A good solicitor is a key hiring decision which impacts the success and smooth running of the buying process. You will also need a good surveyor to assess the condition of the property. And finally, organizing your financing and paperwork in time. Most are eligible for investment loans in the UK under certain circumstances. Typical lending rates tend to be 65% loan to value and interest rates tend to be one and a half to two and a half percent above Bank of England base rates. Many organize their financing through foreign banks with whom they already have long standing relationships. Some find it easier to secure loans with their own country as they have established assets that they can borrow against. Regarding paperwork, at the time of hiring a solicitor, you will need to produce various documents to provide, to prove your identity, residency status, and source of funding. Handling this in advance helps the conveyancing process progress swiftly. I'm often asked by my clients, what is the difference between leasehold and freehold? Leasehold is the method of owning property, usually a flat, for a fixed term, but not the land on which it stands. Possession of the property will be subject to the payment of an annual ground rent. When the lease expires, ownership of the property reverts back to the freeholder. The lease length may be extended by agreement with the freeholder at a specified cost. And nearly all flats in London are leasehold. Freehold, on the other hand, outright ownership of the property and land on which it stands, usually a house. A freehold estate is where the owner of the land has no more time limit to his period of ownership. Regarding an investment purchase, alongside capital appreciation, as Anuj stated, the current yield being achieved is approximately 3%. Some buyers initially take a buy to let approach, anticipating that in five to 10 years time, their children will be ready for boarding school or university. New bills are also a popular avenue, but I would advise a degree of caution here. There is a great deal of supply. Always look at who the developer is, the location and the ongoing site management before you buy. A sounder investment could be an older property. London has beautiful period buildings which will always be sought after by renters. Thank you, thank you, Rashma. I think, yeah, that, that's, that's quite useful in terms of the introduction, isn't it? In terms of uh, setting the stage for us, in terms of what is available and, and the process to be followed, uh, because that's very important because someone coming from Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, it, it, the, the process is very different back home. So it, it, uh, it's, it's good to get in. Uh, in fact, when I moved to the UK, even terms like conveyancing and all was quite new to me till, till I, I understood and got to the nitty gritty of it. But thanks for that. And I'll come back to you in terms of the do's and don'ts and other aspects of, of buying a property. But I'm quickly going to jump back to, uh, before I go to Sanjeev and, and put him in the tax spot, I'm going to jump to Pallavi again. Uh, in terms of the Indian tax angle, if, before we get the UK tax aspect right, both from a FEMA perspective and from the Indian taxation perspective, what, what, what are the things that we need to get it right or the high net worth individuals need to get it right before they, they jump onto this bandwagon uh, of, of buying a real estate asset in, in, in the UK? I think the more important aspect here, Chandru, is definitely from a FEMA uh, regulatory perspective. You know, there are, uh, uh, you know, there are restrictions in terms of uh, the various routes that you can follow. Uh, there are four broad sort of avenues available under which you can invest in a real estate uh, overseas. One is what we uh, sort of loosely call our LRS scheme, which is the liberalized remittance scheme. Uh, then we have what we call our ODI scheme, which is the overseas uh, investment scheme. And then there is also for those who've been abroad in the past and have what we call RFC accounts, resident foreign currency accounts. So you've already got the foreign currency sitting in an account. You know, that can be used for buying a property. And another thing, what we call export of goods scheme, 
which is essentially for companies in India with such a branch offices and you know rep offices, and they want to buy uh, you know a piece of property overseas. Uh, so these are the four routes. But I think for our discussion purposes, the really the two ones that are relevant are the LRS, mm -hmm. which is the liberalized remittance scheme, where you know every individual, every resident in India, including a minor, can remit up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars every year and park them into an account overseas. And I think from the perspective of buying a property, uh, you know, there's a couple of things one needs to be mindful of. And that is that, you know, while sort of your, your spouse can also remit money, your children can remit money, they should also be stakeholders in the property that is bought. So from a legal perspective, you can't club a capital transaction. And, and I think that's a mistake people make very often. You know, they feel that, uh, you know, it's a family of four and, you know, as the sort of patriarch of the family, you feel you can buy the house in your name while the money is being contributed by all four uh, sort of family members. So I think there are a couple of things you need to be a little careful of uh, from a regulatory perspective. As I said, ODI is more for companies who set up wholly owned subsidiaries or set up a JV. Uh, you know, they can remit up to 400% of their net worth or a yeah, uh, billion yeah. dollars without taking any RBI approval. That's another route that a lot of people choose to take. But I think one needs to be careful that, you know, when you go down the ODI route, uh, you have to have an operating business. So, mm. you know, you can't set up a company to buy a piece of property. Uh, you, it can't be that. It's not for real estate. Real estate is a very regulated and restricted uh, activity as far as our FEMA regulations are concerned. Yeah. yeah. I think from a tax perspective, it's relatively simpler, Chandu. Uh, you know, if, if there is any rental income, uh, then of course, you know, it has to be disclosed if you're an Indian resident. Uh, the double tax uh, avoidance agreement kicks in, you know, to the extent that you've paid taxes overseas, you get a credit for it here in India. So that's pretty sort of straightforward. I think the point I'd like to make here is, I think it was on the chat, I picked up on the chat also earlier, is individuals going under the LRS route cannot take a loan overseas. Yeah. You can't create a indebtedness overseas. That's not allowed. So when if you're looking at buying a two million pound home, then you need to have two million pounds parked in an account overseas well in advance. You don't have the ability to send a you know a million pounds in cash and a, you know raise uh, through a mortgage another million pounds to buy a house. That is not uh, you know available for individuals. For corporates, yes. So if you've gone down the ODI route, you have a sort of legitimate business in the UK. You're looking at buying a you know a residential property for say a guest house or a, for, you know, for a residence uh, for your employees or your directors. Then yes, the company can take a loan. That sort of that, yeah. to there. And I think the last thing I'd probably Sorry. say from a tax perspective is disclosure. I mean, you know, we, we've had Panama Papers, now Pandora Papers. I think a lot of times people want to disclose, but they just sort of gloss over it because they say, oh, the money anyway went to the bank account, you know. But yeah. I think, you know, there is provision in the tax filing form where one must make a full disclosure of the money that you've parked abroad the money that you've used to buy a residential property because there are disclosures sort of required around being beneficiaries of trust, you know, being a signatory on a bank account, buying real estate. So I guess, you know, it's a mix of both, the regulatory mm -hmm. and the tax, but I think people need to be mindful of both uh, before sort of transacting in, in sort mm -hmm. of buying a property abroad. That's that's very useful. And I think I think that's why probably we see that Reshma and... and, 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 and uh, peers of Reshma tend, tend to be busy around the March, April time, isn't it? Because a family of four uh, tend to send a million pound, uh, a million in, dollars, in, in, a million million dollars. dollars in, in, in March of, and then they can send another another million dollars in, in April and that way they can actually create a pool of two million. And, and, and so, so that's one way. Uh, I'm not a tax man, but I think uh, yeah, that's something that I've seen most. But I think uh, on that note, I think we've created the opportunity. We know how to buy real estate asset. We've sorted the Indian tax out. Now, I think, Sanjeev, over to you. Uh, what do we need to do right to get the UK tax man, keep the UK tax man happy? I think I think if you, somebody asked me 10 years ago when people were coming to the, to the UK to buy property, um, and I think there was a norm, you know, we would say buy via an offshore company, you know, obtain funding with your LRS money, and then going back to Pallavi's point, you can, um, um, sorry, uh, you could, you were able to get bank funding within that company to top up a buy a more expensive property, and so and and, and the benefit of buying an off, using an offshore company in those days was inheritance tax being the primary 
focus because it was the shares in the offshore company were outside the scope of UK tax. So it's very simple. However, move for, since April 2012, there have been a series of changes in the UK, but which were brought in really to counteract the existence of a number of houses owned by offshore companies that were just lying empty in the UK. That's what the focus of the legislation was. And it, the rafts of legislation started with the introduction of a, a flat rate of stamp duty of 15% where companies were acquiring properties, residential properties these are. Um, then we moved on to in April 13, the, the introduction of what we call ATED, which is a, an annual tax, uh, an extra charge of, of companies, own, which com companies owning property, residential property in the UK. And it can range, um, the starting rate is 3,700 a year going all the way up to £237,000 a year. So depending on the value of the property. So that was introduced. But more, the biggest change from, from our perspective was in April 17, when they really extended the scope of UK inheritance tax to shares, offshore shares in property rich companies, uh, residential companies owning residential property. So whereas before, the, the norm structure of an offshore company where the shares weren't caught by inheritance tax, now, where offshore companies own properties, UK residential property, the shares and, and indeed all the value of that property is caught within the UK IHT net. So that's been a fundamental change, which mm. has made us have to rethink the way people acquire property in the UK. So because now by the IHT is balanced, whether you own it personally, uh, properties are owned personally or via an offshore company, the inheritance tax position is the same broadly from a UK tax perspective, insofar as the property is caught, the value of the, the net value of that property, net debt value of that property is subject to inheritance tax on death. So that, that's been a big change uh, in terms of how we structure. So coming to what, how we should structure, I think before one decides on the most appropriate structure, you have to consider a few things, find one of which is what are you gonna do with this property? Uh, if you're going to live in that property, um, then, then one, then you are going to be liable if it's within a company to this annual charge, this eight head charge. If you're going to buy it via a company, you're going to be liable to stamp duty charges, which go up as much as seventeen percent now in September this year. So that's those are the factors. If you're going to personally live in the property, you've also got the point that Balavi made earlier. You're limited on how much LRS money you can use to fund that vehicle. So if you want to buy a property up to one or two million, you might think, well, I still, I can buy that in my own personal name, one or two million dollars, because I'm in the same inheritance tax position. I can just buy it myself. I don't need debt um, and I'm going to live in it. And therefore I don't, I'm not liable to eight ten if I own it personally. So the, the thought process of what you're going to actually use that property for has to be clear from the outset. If you want to use it for family use, we then have to explore quite sometimes, depending on the price of the property, whether you buy it in your personal name or an offshore company traditionally have so i think that was that's one of the key drivers going forward is knowing if you you know that's the difference personal ownership now is very much a possibility and we have over the last since in the last since this last 10 months or nine months since first of jan we've come across set we're working on several projects where people have owned previously acquired property via an offshore company and now the property's increased in value they don't want to pay the annual tax and there's no benefit of holding in the company and they're de what we call de-enveloping those properties and taking them out of the companies putting them to learn into the personal ownership all which is permitted by the indian rules as well as the uk it's just a different type of reporting so we're seeing a development through the standard offshore company route to personal ownership as well now um, i think the the difference one also well, let me touch on it again is if you are going to buy the, where I'm talking about personal, that's, that's personal homes. If you're going to buy properties for re investment or, or property development or just accessing the UK real estate market, then the ODI route is something we're seeing being used a lot as well, especially for larger value transactions, because the exempt, there are various exemptions from all of the ATED provisions um, in terms of commercial estate, it's not within the IHT scope of IHT if you structure them properly. The ODI route is much clearer now in terms of what you can, what are prohibited in terms of real estate, as opposed to what are prohibited. The uh, the legislation moved on. The cloud, we've got a lot more clarity. In, you know, 
with the RBI, it could be through them circular. So there's a lot more clarity in terms of real estate investment generally in the UK. And one has to just decide, is it personal home? Is it an investment asset? Is it, is it a development asset? Am I just accessing what the size of the transaction is? So I think those are the key considerations, um, but it has got a lot more complicated, not only because of these new introductions of changes in the UK rules um, okay. that have come in. Okay. Yes. That's interesting, interesting. Uh, I just saw a question in the chat box and I, probably I can put it to you, Sanjeev. Is that, uh, can, can an Indian individual uh, who is looking to buy an asset, a real estate asset in the UK, buy it in a joint partnership with the UK national? And then in that can, case, can, UK, can, can the UK national take a mortgage? Uh, well, I think we are looking, I'm currently looking on this for client. It's an interesting point because joint ownership I mean, yes, you can. You can own properties, tenants in common. The question of mortgages becomes a little bit more tricky because the way the banks lend, they tend to lend to both parties or take, you know, involve the, 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 the other partner, the non-UK partner into the transaction or the lend. So that's something we just, I think it's very hard to ring fence the lending. And it's definitely something I, we've got to pick up with more clarity from Balevi and her team in terms of how that, but I think it's quite, yes, I, it's worth exploring, but I think it's quite hard. What we have started to see <laughs> is a form of equity ownership. So I have seen structures, we have implemented structures where people from coming from India who want to buy a property in the UK are looking to buy it with, say, a, an individual here, sometimes a, lend, sued a de facto lender. But what they're doing is taking a joint ownership stake with a with an almost a buyback provision which gives them their return on their property so that they're lending but they're taking a, an equity return um, and we're seeing that happen now for larger value transactions it's an interesting you know and somebody came up with the idea and brought it to me to be honest so but it's it's something that's very creative and i don't think it's going to be general application because as you've got to find the right parties but it's definitely something that we're seeing uh, some some mileage in, in exploring Pallavi, is this okay with the Indian tax plan? More than the tax plan, the challenge will be on the regulatory side, uh, Chandru. Uh, as, as I think Sanjeev rightly mentioned, you know, when you are co-owners of a property and you sort of seek a mortgage, uh, every owner of the property has to sort of uh, be a signatory and agree to that. So, you know, it's very difficult to then uh, sort of differentiate between who took the loan, considering the loan was utilized for the property that's been acquired. So I wouldn't really recommend that uh, to anybody uh, and you know i mean i think the regulatory uh, sort of side of things need to be feared a lot more in india than the tax side of things uh, so you know that that's that's sort of being on uh, a bit of an edge there i uh, yeah, wouldn't really recommend it okay. to anybody uh, thanks but i i did pick up a question on the chat uh, chandu which is kind of related i think somebody had asked how does one get the approval to buy a property in the uk and how do you move uh, you know the money into a mm -hmm. bank account. So very simply yeah. put, uh, you know, you don't really need an approval uh, to buy property in the UK. What you need to do is uh, you first need to open a bank account overseas, uh, which is again opened under the LRS route, which your banker, your authorized, who's an authorized dealer can help you with that. It can be your existing banker in India. So for example, if you're banking with, let's say a bank like ICICI, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, they have a branch in London, they can open an yeah. account for you there and they can move the money uh, under a form called A2, under which uh, liberalized remittances are made into your account in the UK. And of course, mm -hmm. if you're working with any of the international banks, it's sort of you know, equally easy to do that because you know, they'll have branches at both ends. So really there is no uh, approval required unless you know, you're breaching anything that allows you to do something in, under the automatic route. Okay, okay. And, and you know, to the point where you know you need more money, then you know you have the ability to park money over a period of time. So you can, you know, as a, as a family of four, you start parking a million dollars every year. You can actually do that for three years, four years, till you think you have the threshold that you want to buy a piece of property. So a lot of planning that that can also that needs to go into it. Doesn't Absolutely, it? And, and you know, maybe Sanjeev could talk a little bit about that. You know, whole concept of clean capital. Yeah. Uh, yes, and this is yeah. relevant not just from the prospect of buying a property, but even yeah. from an immigration perspective. Exactly. I think, exactly. You know, just you, come I, on that that, that was another question which was there in the chat that, you know, uh, for immigration, if I need two million pounds, 
can I put 1 million in a property and, you know, take a mortgage and have cover up the 2 million? That again doesn't work. That maybe since yeah, you the, a little bit about the, the visa capital, doesn't allow that actually. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I, is I Sanjeev? I don't think that, I think you're right. I don't think the visa no any longer it used to. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure many years ago when I used to do advice on it, no. you could. I think the new visa rules don't allow you to just, yeah. it's going to be your money and free cash now investments. Come, but coming back to your point on, generally migrating to the UK. I mean, I think, uh, to, I would reiterate what Anij mentioned earlier on, that I think the UK still is a very, has a very favorable tax regime for people coming to the UK. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, with some planning, you could act actually avoid paying any UK tax for the first seven years. And then after you can live in the UK by paying what we call the remittance basis charge, uh, which is nominal, I mean, it's nominal £30,000 a year going to £60,000 a year, but it's relatively immaterial. So therefore you can live in the UK without paying tax, um, unlike the US, for example, which is a global tax regime. So, you know, worldwide taxation, whereas here we have special rules for non-domiciliaries, um, which are very favourable. Um, or migrating to the UK, I think Balavi just touched on it. I think the key, if somebody asked me what the key thing, planning thing is, you must, in tandem with your visa, you must think about clean capital and creating a pot of clean capital um, before pre, you know, pre, before arriving in the UK, taking residence and create this pot and more importantly, segregate that pot, find, put in place a mechanism for segregating capital because it's on that capital you can use, you can remit to the UK tax-free to live your life. It's spend, spending money here for as long as you want without so paying tax. Sorry, uh Okay, just for the layman, can you define clean capital? Yeah, so clean, clean capital is really essentially any money you have before you become tax resident in the UK. Any funds you personally have accumulated prior to you coming to the UK. That is your clean capital pot. Once you've come to the UK, you, you fall into this regime where potentially, you, once you become tax resident here, you are liable to any, any income and gains you remit post your arrival and, and remit to the UK, they are taxable. So it's very important to keep this clean capital separate and have your income. And it, you know, most banks, I would say, are quite savvy in terms of how they segregate accounts. And quite simply, it's keeping a capital account and making sure the income is credited, the interest on that account is credited, separate account, and doing various steps, planning steps. It's a bit more complicated than that, but broadly, that's the way of uh, achieving this. But Make, carrying that clean capital and identifying it and um, segregating it is quite an important step in, before you come to the UK. And people don't do it and they mix it all up. And the minute you've mixed income and capital um, and arrived in the UK, we have it quite often, then it's then you have to go backtrack and extract all the income that you've accumulated. Since And it's a, it's a trickier process. So just a bit of planning in advance mm. can save a lot of trouble later on. Um, but, but that I would say that's one of the key steps to think about. Mm -hmm. Sanjeev, can I quickly put you in a tight spot in terms of yeah. uh, like personal versus corp uh, in corporate vehicle? What's what, what's your preference? And the other one is ATED versus IHT. Well, I, well, well the, the, the biggest, as I say, personal and corporate from an IHT perspective is about the same now, you know, because of, since April 2017, the, the biggest challenge one has in terms of personal ownership is the access to bank, bank funding. You can't borrow. I mean, as individuals, you mm -hmm. can't borrow under the RBI norms. You can't borrow money in the UK. So you, you're almost forced down the corporate route. And if you go down the corporate route, then I would say one has to think um, about how you can reduce that potential exposure to inheritance tax going forward by the debt mechanism you use. So if, for very simply, it's the shares in the company that call, are liable to inheritance tax, and the value of those shares can be reduced by the debt within the company. So some thought process there. I would say that's uh, ATEM in itself is just a, an annual charge. Now, as I said, for properties up to £1 million, pounds, it's £3,700 a year. So you one accepts it on the basis like they can borrow more uh, freely in a company, so you just accept that. I think the the, between 2 million and 5 million, the ATED goes up to 25,300 per annum, so slightly more material figure 
but one still has to think about the access to funding and loan finance, which you can only get for your company. So, you know, one, yeah, if, yeah. If, and if you're, if you're just generally, I would also make point that if you're not using this property as your home and you're just buying it to it for other purposes, then you, there are exceptions from the ATED provision. So, mm. you know, one has to also think about property development, property investment is exempt from that in certain circumstances. It, you can also, so it's, it's a factor. So I would think personal makes more sense because it's easier, except for under the India norms, it's a bit more restricted because of funding. Yeah. So I think you have to take all that into consideration, all the various points of consideration while while you look you're looking to buy this second home in, in the UK. So th thanks for that, Sanjeev. I'm just wait of the time available with us. So I'm going to quickly, very, very short answers requesting for short answers from a panelist. So Reshma, London versus rest of the country, uh, how do you see the difference of buying a property in London vis-a-vis, -vis, say, in Manchester or Liverpool or somewhere else? Do you see any difference or is it all the same? It's not the same. Um, firstly, of course, it's about where you want to be based in. But certainly in the last year, um, the commuter belt areas have uh, significantly gone up in value. So the mm. likes of Surrey, Hampshire, um, all of those areas um, have seen a rise. Uh, but I would say that the main focus actually is for um, our audience, which uh, would be in central London, because I think mm. that still is where the demand will be when one chooses to buy a home. Yeah. Uh, of course, you can look a little bit outside of London where demand has also gone up, like um, Chiswick, Richmond, where you're just a little bit outside, but you have access to a lovely size home, garden, and you're no more than 20 to 30 minutes from central London. So those areas have seen a significant rise um, in value uh, and demand. Um, and access to private point, schools? Access to private schools, grammar yeah. schools, that, that's also criteria, isn't it? Yes, that is. Of course, it depends on um, what the family's, family's um, yeah. ne needs are and why they're mm -hmm. coming over here. So, yes, if that is the case, then that's um, something that they would have to plan for in advance with some of the schools um, and then use services that help them uh, get okay. there sooner rather than later. Perfect, perfect. And um, I'm, I, I'm just going to put all the panelists again in a tight spot. One, uh, just two minutes we have, so 30 seconds each. So Reshma, can we start with you? One, one do and one don't uh, for uh, an Indian high net worth individual looking to buy uh, their, their most cherished second home in the UK. Okay, if I may uh, take two don'ts in the one sentence. Do, okay. um, do, Pick somebody that you trust who, who protects your privacy. So discretion mm -hmm. is very important, I believe, for high net worth families. And another do would be ensuring that your agent acts for you, because uh, mm -hmm. that is not always the case. And yeah. uh, you should seek independent advice and not just rely on what the estate agent tells you. And an, an unusual don't would be don't be afraid of short leases because short leases present an opportunity to buy at great value. And it's just a matter of finding a very good lease extension expert that guides you through the process. So those would be my two. Excellent, that's, that's very, very useful. Thank you for that. Anuj, one, one do and one don't for an Indian investor? Well, I think maybe the, the, the do is uh, do plan ahead and do take advice and perhaps talk to your peers and family and friends who have done it already and mm -hmm. on what uh, challenges or uh, mistakes they've made. Uh, so that would be a, a, a do. Um, and I think the, the don't is, well, it's actually don't, don't buy, a prop, buy a second home um, unless you have some very good reasons why you want to buy a second home. Okay. That's, that's, that's useful, absolutely. Very, very practical advice coming from you, Anuj. Um, Sanjeev, putting a tax, uh, man, tax cap on? <laughs> I was going to say, I would always say, take, take lots of, do take some advice before you, there are, it's not overly complicated, but there are some options. And if you take the advice at the beginning, it, hmm. you know, it would just be the right way. Um, and then the don't is don't act without taking the advice. So <laughs> maybe one of those same things. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Sanjeev. And, and then I'll, I'll give the final word to Pallavi. Pallavi, uh, final comments from you. 
Thanks, Chandru. I'm probably going to echo what uh, you know Sanjeev and Anuj have said. You know, take advice. Take advice from Grant Thornton. Uh, you Absolutely. Know, take good advice. We've done a lot of these transactions across the borders to talk to us. And as I said, don't is you know sort of don't gloss over the disclosure part of things. Uh, I think that's extremely, extremely important. We all forget that, but I think that's important. But before we sign off, uh, Chandu, I just wanted to sort of make one point. It's something I picked up from the chat. And sure. since we've spoken a lot about how boundaries don't matter anymore, uh, you know, there was a question from somebody in the chat saying that, uh, you know, what happens if the chief executive or the managing director of a company decides yeah. to sit in the UK? Is there a, what we call in India, poem impact? Mm -hmm. based on executive yeah. management? I think that's an ex extremely well uh, asked question. Yes, there is the short answer. So, you know, one can, if, if you choose to move, uh, you know, out of India, you can continue to be on the board. You can be a director on the board of a company. You can you sort of participate in board meetings, but you cannot hold an executive position. Mm -hmm. So you can't be the managing director or full-time director and, you know, be located overseas because you can't be running the company. And, you know, I'm sure uh, just as we have poem issues, uh, you know, UK also has uh, specific people, uh, you know, uh, issues of you know management sittings in in different locations so i think there is an exposure there but i just wanted to leave that because you know we've sort of spoken for a very long time about how you know sort of boundaries don't matter but yes which is why you know you need to come to a firm like grant Thornton to understand that you know when you move people around there can be implications uh, also so Absolutely. i guess on that note thank you chandru Thank you. Thank you to all my panelists. And, 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 and can I hand it back to you, Pallavi, for, for your closing remarks uh, before Absolutely. we bring the session to an end? Thank you very much. Thank you to all discussion. my panelists. Yeah. We've, we've had a great discussion. Thank you ever so much, uh, Dave, Hari, Sanjeev, Reshma, Anuj, Chandru, for sort of coordinating this very exciting discussion. I think it's been great. We are just spot on time to wrap up. I do realize that there are a lot of questions in the chat which are very yeah. pertinent. And I think what we will do is we will put a sort of key highlight of the discussions and answer some of these questions after reaching out to all of you and share them with those who participated today. And on that note, I'll call it a wrap. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.